Across many parts of the world, the 1960s is known as the Decade of Change. In the US, the civil rights movement and the assassination of Martin Luther King Jr. made waves across the country, while in the UK, teenagers grew up knowing they were free from conscription and able to actively enjoy their youth. Like many eras, its mysteries are often overshadowed by all the major milestones. In today's episode, we aim to shed light on two horrific forgotten cases from the 1960s. But first, I'd like to thank Surfshark VPN for sponsoring today's episode. The internet is an immensely important tool for us at Cold Case Detective, where the majority of our research takes place. It provides us with access to news and information, a place to share all of our documents and data and various streaming platforms to find valuable wisdom on the topics we are covering. The problem is, sometimes that critical documentary isn't available in the country we're located, and public Wi-Fi leaves us concerned about sharing files across easily accessible servers. Luckily, with Surfshark VPN, those concerns are completely solved. Surfshark VPN is an unparalleled virtual private network with unbelievably protective perks and easy-to-navigate security features meant to mask your online activity. All of your internet browsing, including where you're doing it from, is withheld via military-grade encryption to prevent people from snooping in. This allows you to share files safely, access your bank accounts, and feel confident wherever you are, even when using shared Wi-Fi. Surfshark VPN also allows you to change your location in real time to one of many servers found all over the globe. This means that if a certain film or documentary we need for research is unavailable in our country, we can simply travel to a different part of the world via Surfshark and access that media in a matter of seconds. It's a seamless process with zero risk attached. Surfshark VPN also includes a no strings attached, no logs policy meaning your data will never be collected or sold no matter what. You can also enjoy the peace of mind of their cookie pop-up blocker and clean web initiative, where millions of phishing scams and malicious websites are automatically blocked at your convenience. Sign up for Surfshark VPN using the link in the description below and enter promo code COLDCASE for 83% off and an extra three months for free. The internet is an unpredictable place, Use the tools at your disposal to make it secure. Daisy Zick January 14, 1963, was a bitterly cold day in Battle Creek, Michigan. With wind, snow, and freezing temperatures, it was the kind of weather that required multiple layers of clothing before one could comfortably face it. It is perhaps partly down to these severe weather conditions that a killer has escaped justice for almost six decades. Daisy Marie Zick was a 43-year-old mother and wife employed at the Kellogg's factory and residing in Battle Creek at the time of her death. On the morning of January 14th, she prepared her lunch, which she would take to work, and spoke on the phone with several people, including her husband and a friend. She prepared to go and meet another friend for coffee before starting work. However, Daisy's plans were interrupted. A neighbor looking out of their window at 10 o'clock that morning saw a man approach the Zick family porch. When the police were called to the home later that day, they'd discover all the evidence they needed to recount the 43-year-old's movements after 10 a.m. It is believed that Daisy knew her killer and let them into the house. In the kitchen, she confronted them, and she then attempted to use the phone, likely to dial emergency services. This was before 911 was implemented, so it wouldn't have been as easy as it would be today. However, Daisy's attacker cut the phone line with a sharp implement, likely the same weapon that was used to kill her which was determined to be a spoilage knife used by the workers at the Kellogg factory. After the phone line was cut, Daisy fled to the master bedroom where she was struck in the head and knocked unconscious for a brief period of time. During this window of calm, the killer took the belts from her dressing gown in the bathroom and tied up her hands. 
She then regained consciousness and struggled with the perpetrator, who stabbed her several times while she was on the bed. The 43-year-old managed to break loose and ran to the spare bedroom. Here, she was stabbed in the torso several more times and collapsed, pulling the hi-fi unit with her. Afterwards, the killer climbed on top of her and stabbed her to death. Daisy's body was penetrated with the spoilage knife a total of 27 times. Once she was dead, the perpetrator emptied the contents of her handbag. They took some cash and her car keys and fled the scene in her white 1959 Pontiac Bonneville. The car was later found abandoned at Michigan Avenue, one of the county's busiest roads. The killer was seen by several witnesses, both driving Daisy's car and earlier when they entered and exited the home. But unfortunately, the description of the individual is not ideal. They wore several layers due to the bitterly cold weather, which made them difficult to identify. Daisy's case was complicated by the fact that the possibilities seemed endless. The 43-year-old was engaged in a string of ongoing affairs, and while investigators began working on the idea that she was murdered by a jealous lover, a rejected former boyfriend or an angry spouse, or a girlfriend, they couldn't initially pin down any solid suspects. Davy's colleagues at the Kellogg's factory were interviewed and given polygraph tests, but this told authorities very little and failed to propel the investigation forward. Her husband, Floyd, who was described as an alcoholic who was also having affairs, was cleared thanks to a watertight alibi and the fact that he passed a polygraph test. Very little evidence had been left behind at the scene. The only things discovered by investigators were fibers left from the killer's gloves and a single fingerprint in Daisy's car. Several years passed before the state Michigan police finally identified a suspect, Davy's postman, William Daly. He came to investigators' attention for several reasons. His description of her garage door on the morning of the murder didn't line up with what they knew to be true. Furthermore, locals mentioned that he'd told them he'd seen the 43-year-old naked and he was known to have a violent temper, once telling his daughter-in-law that he knew who had killed Daisy and claimed she would end up the same way. Daly told law enforcement that he had seen a man walking on Michigan Avenue near the Chuck Wagon restaurant at around the time Daisy's car had been abandoned, but later changed this statement to say he had seen a woman. While it was difficult to get an accurate description of Daisy's attacker due to the clothing situation, Daly's hairstyle was said to have matched that of the man witnesses saw in her car and who was seen leaving her home after the crime had occurred. Daly also owned a jacket similar to the one described by witnesses who saw the perpetrator. He reportedly stopped wearing it after the murder. However, investigators were never able to determine a motive as to why Daly had attacked Daisy. They also do not appear to have found concrete evidence linking him to the case. He refused a polygraph test until his death. No other suspects seem to have been identified in Daisy's case, which remains unsolved. If you have any information about her murder, you can contact the Michigan Crime Stoppers at 1-800-773-2587. Louis Allen Born on April 25th, 1919, Louis Allen spent much of his life residing in Amite County, Mississippi. In the 1960s, the country had a population that was mostly made up of African Americans, and its economy was based on agricultural labor, such as dairy farming and logging. Like much of the American South during this time period, citizens of Amite County were subject to some horrific and brutal abuse by both the laws in place at the time and by the white residents of the area. Segregation laws were in effect during this time, and the Mississippi State Constitution made life difficult for anybody who wasn't white, disenfranchising black people using the likes of poll taxes, literacy tests, and grandfather clauses to deter and altogether stop them from voting. Between 1940 and 1960, the population of black people in the state dropped by 29%, many leaving to seek better treatment and opportunities elsewhere, heading to the North and Midwestern states. However, despite the hardships of being a person of color in Amit County, Louis Allen was determined to make it his home. He enlisted in the army at the age of 23 and fought in the Second World War before returning home to Mississippi, where he started up his own logging business while working as a farm laborer. Together, Louis and his wife Elizabeth had four children. Soon, the family logging business became so successful that Louis was able to purchase property 
where he and his family raised cattle. In the early 60s, a local chapter of NAACP, the National Association for Advancement of Colored People, was founded by E.W. Steptoe for the purpose of registering black voters. Steptoe was soon joined by Bob Moses of the Students' Nonviolent Coordinating Committee, or the SNCC. In August of 1961, Moses filed charges against a man named Billy Jack Caston. Caston was the cousin of the Amit County Sheriff, Daniel Bryant Jones, and was the son-in-law of a pro-segregation state legislator called E. H. Hurst. Moses alleged that Caston had assaulted him and other civil rights activists, leading a white mob to harass and attack them. This was the first time in the county that an individual of color had legally challenged white violence, but it was to no avail. An all-white jury acquitted Caston. At the time, people of color could not be jurors because they could not vote. As a result of this decision, Bob Moses was escorted to the county line for his own safety, leaving Amit country in January of 1962. Meanwhile, E.W. Steptoe consulted with Department of Justice agents in Jackson about the intimidation tactics which were used by prominent white men in the town of Liberty, where he and Louis were living, although this failed to really go anywhere. A month after Moses filed charges against Caston, on September 25th, E. H. Hurst, Caston's father-in-law, shot and killed an NAACP member named Herbert Lee at the Westbrook Cotton Gin. Twelve men, including Louis, witnessed the murder. An inquest conducted just hours later featured countless white men armed with weapons, a scene so intimidating that nobody wished to put a target on their back. Every witness, including Louis, was pressured into giving false testimony, backing Hearst's claim that he had killed Lee in self-defense. As a consequence, Hearst was cleared of any wrongdoing in the murder. However, the guilt weighed on Louis's mind, and he eventually told several activists what had really happened. They encouraged him to tell the truth. Activist Julian Bond told Louis that he should report what he saw to the FBI, although he knew Louis could endanger his life by doing so. Bond would later recall, quote, He lied at Hearst's inquest because he was in fear of his life. If he had implicated a powerful white man in a murder of a black man, he was risking his life. I tried to encourage him to tell the truth, but you know, it was like saying, why don't you volunteer to be killed? Still, Louis took the advice and went to speak with the FBI and the US Commission of Civil Rights in Jackson. A federal jury was to consider charges against Hearst, and Louis questioned if he would receive protection in exchange for testifying. An FBI memo reported that he, quote, expressed fear that he might be killed. Despite this, the Department of Justice told the father of four they couldn't give him refuge, so Louis refused to cooperate and instead parroted Hearst's version of events. Despite not testifying against Hearst, word spread of Louis's visit to the Department of Justice, reaching the ears of the white community in Amit County. These white locals opted to shun him and stopped doing any business with him, making it difficult for Louis to support his family and keep his business afloat. In August of 1962, Louis and two other black men were shot at by an unidentified individual while they attempted to register to vote. Following this, a white businessman told him, Louis, the best thing you can do is leave. Your little family, they're innocent people, and your house could get burned down. All of you could get killed. The father of four reported the death threats to the FBI but they simply referred the matter to the county sheriff's department because at the time, the federal authority had limited jurisdiction over civil cases. Furthermore, the FBI referred the matter to Sheriff Jones, despite knowing, as proved by a 1961 memo, quote, Allen was to be killed and the local sheriff was involved in the plot to kill him. Things only grew worse for Louis from here. Once Jones was told about the death threats, he took it upon himself to personally attack and harass Louis for anything and everything. In a later interview, Louis's son, Hank, would describe the sheriff as mean. He recalled one specific incident on June 30th, 1962, where Jones arrested Louis for supposedly interfering with police business. Hank told CBS News, and he had handcuffed him, told him he was under arrest, so Daddy asked for his hat, told Daddy, no, you can't go get your hat. Daddy said, well, my son is on the porch. Can he bring me my hat? He drawed back, 
he took a flashlight and he struck my daddy and broke his jawbone. Following his arrest, Louis was held in county jail for several days and denied medical care for his jaw. After his release, the father of four filed an assault complaint with the FBI against Jones. He testified in front of an all-white jury that dismissed the case. In February of 1963, a black man named Leo McKnight, who'd worked with Louis and had twice tried to register to vote with him, died in a suspicious fire alongside his family. The black community believed he had been murdered. No charges were ever brought. In November that year, Louis was arrested by Jones again. This time, he alleged that the father of four had forged a check and had possession of a concealed weapon. Law enforcement officials threatened Louis with three to five years behind bars. After three weeks of detainment, the NAACP raised enough money to post his bail. Eventually, Louis decided he could no longer take the treatment he was being subjected to. He had remained in Liberty, Amit County for so long because he had been caring for his sick elderly parents. But once his mother passed in January of 1964, he made the decision to leave for Milwaukee, Wisconsin, where his brother lived. However, Louis never made it. On the night of January 31st, the day before he was due to leave town, he was murdered on his property, ambushed at the cattle grid which bordered his land. His son, Hank, who was 17 at the time, found his father's body, partially underneath Louis's vehicle. Hank was interviewed about his father's death in 2011. He stated, quote, Sheriff Daniel Jones told my mum that if Louis had just shut his mouth, that he wouldn't be laying there on the ground. He wouldn't be dead. Being the county sheriff, it was, of course, Jones who led the original investigation, which began on February 1st. The FBI also became involved after an individual at the Department of Justice contacted them to suggest Louis may have been slain because of his alleged participation in voter registration activities. However, a few months later, in May, the FBI closed their investigation as they were unable to establish whether or not Louis was involved in these kinds of activities. Jones arrived at the crime scene at 1.25 a.m. on February 1st, accompanied by the coroner, who determined Louis had been dead for around two hours. He had sustained two shotgun blasts to the head and had likely been killed where he was found. No autopsy was conducted on Louis's remains, and no evidence was collected from his body. Jones conducted a crime scene sweep alone, where he found no physical evidence. Over the next few months, no motive or suspects were ever identified. Jones told the FBI that his investigation was ongoing, but according to documentation, he did not conduct any further inquiries. The case was not visited again until 1994, when a historian named Platter Robinson who worked at the Tulane University in Louisiana, began examining the case files. His research pointed him in the direction of Daniel Jones, who he thought was the most likely perpetrator. In 1998, Robinson had a recorded interview with Reverend Alfred Knox Sr., an elderly black preacher in Liberty, who claimed that his son-in-law, Archie Weatherspoon, and another black man, Jack White, were recruited by Daniel Jones to carry out the murder. Knox stated, My son-in-law went with him. Robinson asked, to kill Louis Allen? To which Knox replied, to kill Louis Allen. He didn't know where he was going till he got in the car. And he said, would you pull the trigger? Would you shoot him? To which he replied, no, I ain't gonna do it. That's what my son-in-law said. I ain't gonna shoot him. You come out here to kill him, you kill him. Jones, whose father was a high-ranking member of the KKK, and who was himself a long-suspected murderer of the Klan as well, was approached by Robinson for comment. Jones told the historian that he was 100% certain that the Klan was responsible for Louis's murder. He added that he had many things to be sorry for in his life, but denied being involved with the murder. When Robinson told him that the two men had implicated him in the crime, Jones replied simply by stating if there was evidence, he'd have been charged. To explain away the poor investigation he carried out after Louis's death, Jones said he did not order an autopsy, as the cause of death was obvious. Furthermore, he stated that he recalled seeing a pistol on the ground when he first arrived at the scene, but this is contrary to all of his previous statements about the crime scene. Jones told Robinson that he had two theories about the case. 
that it was a domestic issue and Louis was killed by a family member or someone else who was part of the black community, or he was killed because he'd witnessed the murder of Herbert Lee and somebody didn't like that he'd attempted to go to the FBI. In April of 2011, CBS covered the case as part of their 60 Minutes segment. Their reporter, Steve Croft, traveled to Liberty to interview local residents. However, he was met mostly with silence. Croft had a brief interview with Jones at his property. The former sheriff denied killing Louis and invoked his Fifth Amendment rights when asked if he was involved with the KKK. Most of the individuals involved in this case are now dead. Reverend Knox died in 2006, and Archie Weatherspoon passed away five years earlier. Jack White is also now deceased. The FBI reopened the case between 2006 and 2007 as part of its cold case program that re-examines civil rights unsolved cases, and it identified Daniel Jones as the prime suspect. However, they were never able to collect enough evidence to bring charges against Jones, who died in 2013. The case is still unsolved. If you have any information about Louis's case, you can submit a tip to the FBI using the website tips.fbi.gov. And there you have the facts. Please leave a comment down below with your own theories and speculations, and remember to like this video and subscribe to support the channel. Thank you for watching. Stay alert, stay safe, and I'll see you next time.